Hi, welcome to the series of lessons all about Pilyawin's 1969 study, which is about a phenomena called Good Samaritanism. Samaritanism is essentially helping others. A good Samaritan is somebody who's very good at helping others. And um, before I introduce you to the study, etc., one thing you should know is that the title of this study, unlike many others, is uh, a pun um, because it says Good Samaritans an underground phenomena. And this entire study was conducted on an underground subway. And the phenomena of helping or not helping other people at the point in time at which this study was done is also something that was kind of underground. So this is, a, I think, a really cool uh, name for a study. But I think that's also just my nerdy fascination with things. Um, so now let's uh, get into an introduction of what the study actually was. I'll give you a quick overview and uh, I will introduce you to the key terms that are used throughout the course of this study, if you read the original study, or if you read it from a textbook, or if you're watching a lesson from the middle, this introduction section will really help. So now, let me introduce you to Pilyavin's 1969 study called Underground Samar sorry, Good Samaritans and Underground Phenomena. A uh, funny name, but a really cool study. So first of all, this study is one of the three that are part of the social approach in the Cambridge syllabus. But uh, before I look at the study itself, just remember that in the social approach, psychologists are influenced by two core assumptions. The first of those assumptions is that all of our thoughts, um, all of our behaviors and our feelings are things that we learn through social interaction. And that social interaction means essentially how you interact with other people, your exchanges with them, your conversations with them, things like that. And the second assumption of the social approach is that all of your actions, your behaviors, your feelings are impacted by the actual imagined or implied, which means that you may not know if somebody is actually present or not, but the implication is that they might be. Think of the invigilator who's at the back of the exam room and you're in the front. You can't see them, but you kind of know they're there. So all of your behaviors, your feelings, your thoughts are influenced by this actual imagined or implied presence of an other. If you might, um, an easy way for you to remember what the social approach is, is to just think about how much of what you do on a daily basis, you think about how other people would do things and you think about how other people would feel about how you behave. Um, if you're from a brown family, think about the phrase, Lo kya kahenge, that'll help you remember and understand what the social approach is. So now coming back to Pilyavin's study, it was focused on something that we call pro-social behavior. Pro-social is a term that's come up in other lessons as well. Um, pro-social behaviors are basically all of our helping behaviors. So pro-social behaviors are behaviors that contribute to the good of a collective, to the good of a group, or to the good of just one individual. Now, Pilyavin's study is really important because he's trying to figure out why is it that some people help other people in need and why is it that some people don't help other people in need? And he was focusing particularly on why we do or do not help strangers in need. Because, and we learn about this in more detail in a later lesson, but he was building off as much of psychology does off of existing research at the time. So he was looking at studies that were done in the 1950s and the 60s. And even though that probably feels like it was a century ago and it was almost a century ago, some of what he found was quite important. So stay with me. The first phenomena that inspired him to do his work was called bystander apathy. It's also called the bystander effect. A bystander is someone who is literally just by the sidelines of anything. Um, so, for example, if you're driving down the road and you see a small car crash or you see two cars stopped by the police, you watch them and you drive by. You watching them is you being a bystander to that event. Bystander apathy. Apathy means indifference. Indifference is an emotion 
where you literally don't feel anything. It's not that you feel pain. It's not that you feel anger. It's not that you feel happy. You just don't feel anything. You're indifferent. So bystander apathy is a phenomena where people who are sort of at the edges or watching something happen don't engage with it at all to help another person. It's almost like they don't care. So that was one key phenomena that was present at the time and that was something he wanted to investigate because bystander apathy or this likelihood of people to not care or to seem to not care about another person who's in distress is related to another phenomena which is called the diffusion of responsibility. So diffusion is essentially when something is spread out and responsibility obviously means how much ownership or accountability do you feel towards a particular thing so in very simple words when we talk about diffusion of responsibility we are talking about how the more the people the less any one person feels uniquely responsible for helping someone in need and so The relationship between bystander apathy and diffusion of responsibility is that if you have a very large group of bystanders, the likelihood that you will see a lot more bystander apathy or indifference, or this is called the bystander effect, is because not one of the bystanders feels like it is their key responsibility to step in and help whoever is in need. So that's the relationship between bystander apathy. Remember, it's indifference, it's not caring. And diffusion of responsibility, not feeling singly responsible or uniquely responsible for helping. And combined together, these two at the time of Filiavan's study were used to explain why people don't help other people in public places, people who are in distress, people who are victims of anything. Um, and there was a really tragic event that actually really kicked off a lot of this investigation and exploration into why people don't help other people. Um, And we'll talk more about that event in detail in a later lesson, but it was a brutal murder. So, you know, trigger warning, but uh, we will have to discuss it later. Uh, But how did Pilyavin try and understand why people help or don't help other people? So unlike all of the studies that had been conducted for bystander apathy and diffusion of responsibility, all of these studies were done in a laboratory. Pilyavin's study is actually really unique because in your entire syllabus, it's one of the few, it's one of the only complete field experiments. So when we talk about a field experiment, it's an experiment that is done in the absolutely natural setting of um, anywhere a phenomena occurs. So a field experiment, for example, if you want to study animal behavior and you go to the forest, Um, to study it or you go to a jungle or you go to the Mara plain to study this that's a naturalistic setting you are literally in the field in which your participants or your intended subjects are existing and so Pilyavin study was cool because it was done on a subway as I was talking about earlier and that was the field it was a completely natural setting meaning there was no interference in the actual setting so unlike a laboratory where the setting is very controlled and participants come into this artificial environment a field environment is a completely natural environment and this experiment that he did there was manipulation of course of the independent variables and dependent variables but it was a natural setting it happened on a subway as part of everybody's daily lives um, which is why it's a field experiment And then you come to how he did this field experiment, right? So it's a natural setting, but of course he had independent variables that he manipulated and that's what makes it an experiment because he was trying to understand the causes for for helping or not helping or what are the causes for the likelihood of helping or the likelihood of not helping someone. Um, And so he used an observation um, or a covert hidden observation. Remember, cover means hide. So covert observers are hidden observers. People don't know they're being observed by these observers. Um, So he used this covert observation and the manipulation here of the independent variable was the race of, well, 
victims, so-called victims who are essentially pretending to be hurt or pretending to be drunk. And that plus the type of condition that required help, i.e. being drunk or being ill, those were the key manipulations that were done as part of this experiment. And he just wanted to see, do the people who are riding in this subway train in this natural environment, when they can see and hear someone in need, do they step up and do they help or not? Um, and then if they help, is their helping affected by the race of this particular victim? Remember, there were no actual victims, but there were stooges or actors or confederates. Um, that's a technical term in psychology. The models were people who were supposed to be mimicking helping behavior to see if maybe that influences the likelihood of helping. But in sum, he was essentially trying to manipulate the variables of the race of the victim, the type of the victim, and whether a model was present to help or not help in order to, through his covert, obser covert observers, determine whether those are variables that influence people's decisions to help or not help. Now, the reason that this study, after like so many years, is still being talked about is because it resulted in this really interesting way of looking at why people help or do not help. What Pilyavin found is that opposed to the diffusion of responsibility theory, where, oh, the larger the group, the lesser likelihood to help because nobody feels individually responsible. What he found was that people evaluate whether they're going to help or not based on the costs of helping and the rewards of helping. So if you're wondering what that means, it simply means if I asked you for something, if I asked you for help or, and, and yeah, if I asked you for help, you would think about, well, if I help this person, what will I get out of it? So what is the reward of helping me? Maybe you'll feel good about yourself. And what is the cost of helping me? So to help me, would you maybe need to stop doing what you're doing right now? Would you need to give up something? Would you need to risk potential injury? And on the basis of these two considerations, you literally weigh one against the other. You weigh the costs against the rewards according to Pilyavin. And based on that, you make a decision of whether to help or not help. Now, we'll discuss all of this in much more detail, of course, as we move through each of the lessons in this series. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about the key terms one more time. So Good Samaritanism is theologically, um, it, it originates from theology or from religion. It's a term that was found in the Bible. It's used as a as an idiom of sorts where we talk about it as, oh, so-and-so is such a good Samaritan. So good Samaritanism is used to refer to someone's qualities of helping other people, of being altruistic, which means unselfish, to help the larger sort of group of people one is in. A victim, as defined in this study and defined in the dictionary, is a person who has been victimized, but in this study, it's the person who is in the position of needing help. It's a person who is in distress, and in the context of Pilyavin study, this person was either drunk or ill. Then you have the model. In the context of Pilyavin study, the models were people who were demonstrating helping behaviors just to see if other people would look at them and then be more likely to engage in the same helping behavior. So remember that the way Pilyavin operationalized Modeling or the model is as a helper to stimulate possibly other helping behaviors. Then you have bystander. Um, as I've already talked about, a bystander is just one of the people at the scene of a crime or any situation where somebody is experiencing some sort of public distress. But that bystander in our study is someone who does not engage in helping behavior. Um, when we're talking about bystander, apathy. Then diffusion of responsibility is quite simple. The larger the group, the larger the group of bystanders, 
the lower the likelihood of helping because no one feels uniquely responsible for helping right then you come to latency so in the context of this study if you do read the original paper and i always recommend people should try students should try to read the original study it really helps you understand and make more sense because it's a little more challenging latency is simply the delay in responding to a situation where help is needed as defined in the study so the time that passes defines the latency of um the response so latency is also used in uh, general language to talk about something that is hidden hasn't been expressed so you may have the desire to help but there's a time period that passes before you can actually help so that time is latency in this study um as i mentioned this is a field experiment this entire experiment took place on the subway it's totally a natural environment the participants were all already there they were doing their normal daily commute and a field experiment is great because it has so much real world resemblance it literally takes place in the real world so it has very high ecological validity however because it doesn't have a lot of control standardizing it makes it really difficult which means that reliability for a field experiment is always going to be a little lower or much lower and then you have race so i've mentioned race before where i talked about just a couple of minutes ago pilyavin was trying to look at how race affects the likelihood of helping or not helping or rather receiving or not receiving help his implication was that people of some races may not be as inclined to help people from different races so for your purposes please understand race is a group that is formed of different human beings it's based on shared inherited genetic physical and social characteristics um and typically race is gauged by your skin color and your facial features because that's called your phenotype and that's something that is most prominently visible so caucasian asian african american um or black these are all races um and in pilyavin study the language they use is white and black but essentially they're talking about caucasians and african americans um but african americans are now also called black so it can be a little bit confusing to use this language from the 60s today in 2024 but all you need to remember is this definition of race and do not confuse this please with racism which is bias on the basis of race so we are just talking about race right now now the last thing here is cost and reward matrix so again it was a model that pilyavin developed as a result of this study and his entire intention of conducting the study was to figure out why people help and this model explains that people's likelihood of helping will come from their motivation to reduce the conflict that comes you know so if you think about it any time you see someone who needs help there's a lot of um discomfort it might be emotional and physiological meaning that you feel it in your brain in your heart but you also feel it in your body you physically might be on edge um it's you know when you kind of shudder a little bit when you pass by the scene of a crashed car and you just kind of really just have this really uncomfortable feeling so pilyavin's theory was that the motivation to reduce that kind of discomfort makes us think about should i help or should i not help in terms of the costs and the rewards of helping so it's like a little matrix and then we figure out should i help should i not help and then we make a decision as to how we want to proceed um so these are some of the most important terms that will occur reoccur as you move through this experiment um i'm going to pause now see if there are a few okay no So these are the most important terms that you will come across as we go through each of our lessons in this segment um, um, on uh, Pilyavin's Subway Samaritan study, as it is popularly called.